trends that I see. So I wasn't quite sure what he meant. So I put together some slides that have lines going up and down. So clearly not <laughs> trends. Um, anyway, but I thought I would kind of have the theme be trends that are creating opportunities or for enhancing opportunities for angel investors in life science companies. And what we particularly focus on with CID4, which is the Colorado Institute for Drug Device and Diagnostic Development, um, is drug device and diagnostic development. So one of the first trends I wanted to talk about is the valley of death, which is an old term that's been around now for I think 15 or 20 years. And it's, uh, it refers to the fact that there's a lot of money put into basic research and translational research. And then when it comes to trying to translate that into products, there's a big gap. And it's, you know, these projects have to cross the valley of death, which is a lack of money and a lack of expertise on how to get a product from research into a product, or a research into a product. And so these numbers up here are just showing that the National Institutes of Health awarded one and a half billion dollars worth of grants to our leading research institutions in the state uh, in the five year period from 2010 to 2014. And, of the, and that was funded on just about 4,000 projects. And these are, it's not just basic research, these are, uh, there's a big, trend right now at NIH to uh, fund um, translational things that are getting closer to products. But still, of that, very few make it on the road to developing a product. And so what we've tracked here is how many invention disclosures are filed, and it's only 350. How many of the um, grant programs that uh, April was talking about for uh, getting a grant to establish proof of concept. So now you've done research and now you want to see is there really um, a product here. And only 100 of those were funded for research from universities in the state. And as you come down, only 20 SBIRs were funded in this five year period for on, uh, companies commercializing research from our research institutions. And it goes down to maybe about 50 uh, drugs or devices or diagnostics actually were tested in humans, so made it to that. And I know, you know, you don't expect in five years that they're going to get all the way into humans, but the same amount of funding was in the five years before that, too. So you expect something to be trickling out. And so this is what CID4 focuses on. So we are a 501c3 also. We're funded by both the state and philanthropic uh, investors. And we make small investments in companies that are commercializing from universities, and we also intensely mentor them. So not only ourselves, but we have a lot of volunteers. We have a technical and business advisory committee that have different areas of expertise. We don't know everything about every drug and every device. So, uh, and there's only two people in the entire CID4, as you know. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's our focus, is to try to get some of these numbers, get more. We help people with SBIR proposals, things like this. And we had some impact. So just like April and I was doing a quick calculation, and though our, we've invested about $2 million, and it's these, the companies we've invested in, about nine companies we've invested in, and those nine have been able to raise about $50 million from but follow on capital as well as grants, as well as um, well, venture capital or angel capital, and as well as products. A couple of the companies have launched products and product sales. So that's even better. Uh, and so what is the opportunity for angels that angels uh, can get involved with CID4 because we kind of help companies get to the stage where they can come here to present. And several companies that we've been helping with have presented for those years. So, but some of the other trends, so I'm gonna jump around to a couple other trends. So another trend that we see right now in the drugs, so I'm kind of focusing on drugs now, because we'll hear from device companies tonight. So I'm gonna talk about drugs. So uh, this is Moore's Law backwards. So <laughs> because of, I, I had to have trend lines, right? So the trend is down. And what this, this is starting in 1950 to practically today. And it's saying that actually about every nine years, the number of pro uh, products that are approved by the FDA per billion dollars of research R&D by pharma companies uh, is halved. So it's the opposite of more instead of doubling, it's half. So this is just not the <coughs> half. And but it's 
sort of like, oh, well, that must be the FDA's fault. But it's really, the blue lines here are the number of products that have been approved. So what it is is people going crazy on the R&D spend. And so I kind of was one, you know, there's a lot of problem reasons for this. Uh, one of the big ones that's happened over the last 15 years, I think, is pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in those products that might have a $200 million or a $300 million market. They're only interested in the blockbusters of $3 billion. And so they spend, like, on moonshot projects to get to those billion-dollar drugs and, and don't come out with the little singles and doubles along the way like they used to do. Uh, also, there's been all these mergers of pharma companies, and I think when you get uh, R&D to the scales that they are, it's industrialized, it's not creative, it's bureaucratic, and it's, you know, and these are my opinions, by the way. Um, so, but, but, then, but this is a fact, is that the pharmaceutical companies share, the big pharma companies share, a new uh, medical entities that go into drug development. Used to be 75% of everything that went into drug development. Now it's only 35%, because all the creativity is in the small businesses, and universities. And so that's more opportunities for angel investors because small businesses are where it's at, not where they are. So there's a couple of um, trends that are, I think are a reaction to this incredible cost for developing drugs. And one is repurposing drugs. And repurposing is just, if you've already got a drug that's already approved for one indication, and then you find other indications or not, you, you're the company might not, but researchers at universities or small businesses, they have all these screening assays, they have for a whole different indications, they try to prove drugs, and by gosh, well, you know, it works over here, it might even work better. And in fact, it, uh, this also works for drugs that uh, were along being developed along the pathway to commercialization and the toxicity looked good, the pharmacodynamics looked good, everything looked good, except for it wasn't that great when they did the clinical trials in patients was not as effective as they needed it to be. So then it gets shelved, and then academic researchers, other researchers, take these things off the shelf and screen them for other applications and find things where it works, the efficacy is good. Well now you've already got the talks and all half of the development talks are done, so uh, the development timeline is shorter, it be as short as three years. The costs are like 60% of normal drug development costs. Um, <coughs> The approval rates are faster because it's already been through so much. So 30% of repurposed drugs are approved versus 10% of something de novo. And you can get patent protection if you change the formulation, change the dosing into new indications. So there's ways of getting patents. Uh, and so in 2013, 50% of the drugs approved by the FDA were repurposed. That's really amazing. So, uh, then the other trend that I want to talk about is orphan drugs. And this was a result of the Orphan Drug Act that was passed in 1983. And it provided incentives to pharma companies because there were all these diseases that affected people, or uh, affected patient populations of 200,000 of us. So it wasn't enough money for the pharma company to want to, for pharma companies to want to develop drugs for such a small patient population. They want, you know, 100 million. Taking their drug. And so the incentives are great. $500,000 per year for up to four years to pay for some of the development costs. And these are just grants you don't pay back. Um, you can, the company gets tax credits for up to half of what they spend on their clinical trials. Uh, they user fees that you know, can be up to $2 million for when you're trying for market approval are waived. And you get seven years market exclusivity. So even if it's something that the patents aren't so good on or the patents already expired, you still get seven years market exclusivity. So this, my trend lines, this starts in 83, all three of these graphs start in 83 when this law was passed. And the first one is just how many uh, companies or specific drugs they requested orphan drug designation. And the green one over here on the right is the designations that were granted, and then the uh, red one at the bottom is how many of the orphan drugs have been approved. And so you can see the trend. It's like, oh, this is really a cool thing. So all the big pharmaceutical companies are doing this too. And uh, so 41% of all FDA approved drugs in 2014 were orphan drugs. 
And so repurposed and orphan practically account for everything that's being used. Uh, and then if you, so this, uh, sorry to make you look all this. And before this, so this is basically three decades, 511, before that, the decade before, only 10. So it, the trend is definitely for orphan drugs uh, for all those reasons. And so pharma companies have gotten wise to this, and already there's going to be some reform because they'll take uh, a drug and they'll slice down all the possible diseases you might use this for, even though it could be used for several diseases. Especially this happens particularly in cancer drugs. So they'll pick one cancer like pancreatic. Well, that's fewer than 200,000 patients in the US. So then they'll get orphan drug status. They get the drug on the market. Well, now they go on to gastric cancer with the same drug. They go on to breast cancer with the same drug. Pretty soon it's a $3 billion drug. And they've gotten all this and the market exclusivity so no one can get in there. So uh, it's sort of been taken advantage of, but it still has <coughs> real orphan drugs on the market too. Um, and so you can see the sales have been up to 107 billion total for orphan drugs. Wait a minute, you know I thought they didn't make money, and that's actually what we're getting into. Seven of the ten best-selling drugs in 2015 were orphans, and the median cost for patient is per year is 98,000 for an orphan drug versus what 5,000 for a so you can see why it's attractive, but this is just as attractive to small companies as to big pharma companies. And uh, but all those things, especially for a small company, it means much more to get a five hundred thousand dollar grant and to get all these fees paid. So, so the, in conclusion, uh, the reasons these uh, create opportunities for angel investment because I've talked to a lot of angel investors. I would never invest in any drug opportunity because it takes too long. And but there are ways to invest in drug uh, opportunities that aren't so onerous, repurposed for orphan drugs, because you have all these advantages. And so another way you can get involved uh, is to get involved with us, CIU4, to help us screen and mentor and co-invest with us. And we work with Rock and Venture Club. We also have all the other people that help us really mentor and screen the companies. And then close the investments. Thank you very much.